What's up, y'all? All right, I'm going to keep it 100. I'm going to be honest. The record scratch scared me. It scared me. I got to keep it real. I was like, I was just getting to the, I was like, okay, let me open my Bible. Let me get it together, Jesus. Hey, man, you are here in this place. And they said, Shh. I was like, ah. So I will be honest with you because this is a safe space. Amen, amen. Hey, here, here I, I want to establish that right at the beginning, that for those of you that are new, if this is your first time, first, I'm Damien. I have the honor and the privilege of being one of the pastors here of the Jordan so on behalf of our whole staff and our leadership team, welcome. Can we give it up just for anybody who is new? Just give, just give random praise and applause. Look, you made it. Yes, you did. You made it. It's a lot of people in this room, and you are here. Amen. You are here. So welcome. And one thing that we do is um, we like to establish safe spaces. And so what we do when we really extra, extra need a safe space is we just go like this. Safe space, okay? Let's, let's, let's just, just do it together. Let's just do it together. On the count of three, safe space. One, two, three. Safe space. Ah, oh, that's good. Now, I want you to, now, I want us, a hope is that maybe you might get to know somebody next to you or, or near you and you know who you attend the Jordan with sometimes, even if you've never met them before. Like, maybe now, now just turn to that person or somebody around you, you know, hallelujah. And now, on the count of three, I want you to safe space them, amen? I just want you to hit them with the safe space, okay? On the count of three, one, two, three. Safe space. Yeah. Some of y'all didn't feel safe, though, I know. Some of y'all didn't feel safe. You're like, I'm making eye contact with a stranger, not a safe space. I get it. I get it. I get it. Sometimes you got to walk by faith. Amen. <laughs> what is wrong with me? Hallelujah. All right, so if you did not know, we are in the book of Psalms. It's the soundtrack of Psalms. And we are going to be, this whole summer, we are going to be hanging out in the book of Psalms. We're going to be looking at the book of Psalms. Every week we're going to take a look at a different psalm. And we are going to see what that psalm does in our lives, what it's speaking to, what in context is the psalmist. Or, or this is what they call the psalmist. Another name for the psalmist is Psalter. Ooh. See, y'all going to get a good Bible education, amen? It's called Psalter. Say Psalter. Psalter. P-S-A-L-T-E-R. Okay, amen. Psalter. So the psalmist is also known as the Psalter, the writer of the Psalms. And um, if you have one of our awesome bulletins we got right here, there's a place for you to take notes. And we're going to give you the psalm that we're going to be talking about, the genre. The psalm, just so you have time to get there, is Psalm chapter 22. We're going to be hanging out in Psalm chapter 22 tonight. Psalm chapter 22 is where we are going to be hanging out. And you can circle what type of psalm that you think it might be. I'll tell you in just a few moments what type of psalm it is, but I want to share with you the purpose of this series. The purpose of this series is, is threefold, threefold. And if you take notes, you can go ahead and write this down. It's to enhance your prayer life. Somebody say prayer life. Prayer life. Prayer life. I know I can have a more... Um, more a prayer life with a little bit more substance. I know that for a fact. So it's to enhance our prayer life because what happens in the Psalms, any, okay, let me ask you guys this. Anybody ever have, you know you should pray, but you don't necessarily have the words to pray? Anybody ever have that? Okay, keep, okay, cool, cool. Safe space. You can be honest. Hallelujah. I have that same problem. I know you're looking at me like you talk all the time. You need to stop talking sometimes. I know, okay. Don't be mean, okay. Don't be mean. But sometimes when it comes to praying, I don't know, I don't have words for my feelings. I don't have words, I don't have words of faith, if I can be real with you. There's moments where I'm just like, Lord, here I am. There's been seasons in my life where it's just like, Lord, I, I, all I could do is show up. Here I am. And so one of the hopes and desires in our prayer for this series over the summer is that it would enhance your prayer life by giving you words to pray. 
Psalms are some of the greatest ways for you and I to give God praise and to pray to him, to talk to him, to talk to the Lord. So we want it to enhance your prayer life. We want it to enhance your praise life. Sometimes you can look at the lives of the people that wrote the Psalms and you could be like, mm. Well, praise the Lord, it ain't that bad for me. Hallelujah. <laughs> like these are real people, and that's what I love about the Psalms. The Psalms are some of the realest books in the Bible that you and I can look at. The Psalms keep it real. The Psalms are honest. The Psalms are honest about people that love the Lord, people that fear the Lord, and their struggles with that. I think so often in our faith, we believe that once I have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, life is going to be a dream. Life is going to be grand. I ain't going to go through nothing. And if I do, Jesus is going to come up and scoop me and save me from everything bad. Amen? No. No, man. No. That's just not how it is. And we see that reality in the book of Psalms. We see the reality of sadness. We see the reality of hopelessness, despair in the book of Psalms. But we also see a people who in the midst of hurt, in the midst of harm, in the midst of hopelessness, they turn to a God and they can give him praise right where they are. So our hope is that this series will enhance your prayer life, your praise life. And the last one is your approach to problems life. Amen. Approach to problem. So your prayer life, your praise life, and your approach to problems life. Anybody in here sitting in here today, and you sit next to somebody, and you looking at me, and you got problems. Anybody got problems in the room? Okay, y'all my people, okay? Y'all my people, because I got a lot of problems, and so I feel safe in here. We have problems. We go through things. And the hope that, the hope and the prayer in going through this series is that you can maybe relate to a psalmist or a psalter. You can relate to someone who's going through something hard. You can relate to someone who has a, a particular challenge where all of a sudden their faith, they're doubting their faith, they're doubting the God of their faith. And, and, and maybe the problem that you may be facing or sitting there with, maybe you can approach it a little bit differently knowing that all of heaven has your back. Knowing that nothing that is in your life has not gone through the hands of a God who loves you, who sees you, and is faithful to complete the work he started in you. And some of y'all might be sitting there like, mm, it don't feel like any type of work has been started, okay? The work, where, where are the workers at? They ain't here. And I just want to encourage you, God started something in you. He started something in you. And he is faithful to complete that which he has started. So this series, family, I'm praying that I get to know God in a whole fresh, a whole nother way. And that you get to know God in a fresh, new, and exciting way. Amen? Amen. So that's the journey. Your prayer life, your praise life, your problem life. Prayer, praise, problems. Three Ps. The book of Psalms can help me with my prayers, my praise, and my problems. Hallelujah. That's the hope and the desire. Now, let me give you a few things of the value of Psalms. Value of Psalms. And we touched on it a little bit. If you take notes, write this down. Here's why Psalms are valuable. The Psalms are very valuable because um, of prayer. Prayer. It gives us language to talk to God. And a person's communion. Prayer is our communion, our conversation, our time, and our focus with God. Praise. And I love this definition of praise. This was really cool. Praise is a person's longing for God. Ooh. Praise is a person's longing for God and for others to be moved with the same desire for God. The Psalms have a distinct place in the history of the church. There's a time where these, all these Psalms, the Psalms are, are poems that are written, songs that are written. And there's times and seasons in the history of the church where the church would come together and they would sing these Psalms. They would, in, in, they would congregate just like we are together tonight and they would sing these songs. And they would play the, the lyre and the harp and they would invite everybody to sing these Psalms. So, so it has a really significant place in the history of the church. The Psalms, they inspire the believer with the hope of the kingdom of God. They inspire the believer with the hope in the kingdom of God. 
And that, that is so pivotal in this series that you and I, we understand and discover that we, there's a hope beyond what we can see. There's a hope that goes beyond you landing that career job that you've been studying your life for. Now, you keep going after that job. Go get it. Hallelujah. Let the Lord bless you. But the Psalms are here to encourage and inspire you and I in a hope that goes beyond the situation and the circumstances that we find ourselves in. It's not a hope connected to accomplishment. It's not a hope connected to um, how people look at us and see us. It's, an, it's a hope inspired by the kingdom that we are all a part of now and we will be free in on the other side of eternity. That's some of the things that the Psalms do. The Psalms reflect the faith and experience of the community of God's people before Jesus came. This is bananas. Okay. This is bananas to me. Like we have Jesus we know about Jesus. We look, at the, we look at the New Testament, and it's like Jesus is like, Messiah. And we're just like, oh, there he is, the Messiah. Look at all the miracles. Let's go. The psalmist, they didn't have it like that. The psalmist didn't have Jesus healing the blind man and be like, dang, he must be the Messiah because he healed the blind man. No. The psalmist didn't have that. The psalmist, they are, they, they're writing from a place of, uh, we, we just have to believe. They're writing from a place of, I've witnessed your faithfulness. I can't sing like you, Grace. I wish I could sometimes, girl. You, when you were just, when she was right here, she was like, I, know. I was like, oh, Jesus. Like, I was folded because of the anointing coming from Grace. It was amazing. It was amazing. But, but, but the, the, the psalmists are coming from a place of witnessing. They're coming from a place of, you delivered us from Egypt. You delivered us. You parted the Red Sea. So, so we've seen you do some things, and you say that there's going to be a Messiah that's going to come. So we're going to take you at your word. And I love it because when you take God at your word, at his word, sometimes it gets harder. Oh, sometimes it gets so hard. It gets so challenging. It gets so, or it seems to be. <laughs> it seems to be. Because I, I believe it was already very hard. And then when you get the hope of God's word, I, I, I have expected God's word to do something like, like, like genify the situation, like be a genie in my life. Like, okay, I got his promise. Boom, get better situation. Okay, I got his promise. Boom, get better health. Okay, I'm going to say his promise 17 times a day. Let's go. Boom, 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 boom. Get better. And then when it doesn't get better, it's like, okay, God, you failed me. I'm done with you. You're, you're obviously done with me. Who prays 17 times a day? I did for two days, and you've done nothing. Right? <laughs> okay, that's just my faith. Okay, I'm sorry. That's just, that's just my faith. But I just, I, I want us to be encouraged in the fact that God speaks to us. He's with us. He's for us. And, and we're, we have the opportunity to look at a community of people that didn't have Jesus, but what they wrote prepared the way for him. Okay, we're going to get into that in just a few minutes. I'm excited. Okay. The Psalms, in the Psalms, God addresses both the individual and the community. And we're going to look at, as we, as we dive into Psalm 22, um, you, we see that God speaks to the individual. And so the individual in this particular psalm is a psalm of David. And it's the individual, but through the individual, he also addresses the community. And we see the importance of God pointing to you and saying, I know you. But we also see the importance of God saying, I know you, and I know you need these broken people too. Community, community. Last thing, connection between the Old and the New Testament. A lot of the prophecies of Jesus are found in the book of Psalms. A lot of the prophecies of Jesus, uh, here's what's bananas too. Jesus quotes the Psalms. And we're going to get into it. Oh, I can't wait. Jesus quotes the Psalms. It's bananas. It's absolutely amazing. Okay, so Psalm 22. Hey, fellas in the back, do we have it? Or maybe not? 
saved. They trusted in you and were you never disgraced. Pause it for me. But I am pause it for me. Okay. Pretend you didn't hear none of that. Okay. Erase your mind. Look right here. Okay. I'm an old man. That was men in black. Okay. So, so, so here's what I want you to do. We're going to listen to the book of, we're going to listen to Psalm 22. It's about 31 verses. We're going to listen to it right now. So I just want you to get comfortable in your seat where you are. Um, so for some of you, that may be, you know, like, like even closing your eyes just so you can listen a little bit better. But here's what I want you to also do. I want you to pay attention and be ready to write down or highlight something that stands out to you in this psalm. So listen to Psalm 22. Go for it, my guy. Psalm chapter 22, for the choir director, a psalm of David to be sung to the tune, Doe of the Dawn. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night I lift my voice, but I find no relief. Yet you are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors trusted in you, and you rescued them. They cried out to you and were saved. They trusted in you and were never disgraced. But I am a worm and not a man. I am scorned and despised by all. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads saying, is this the one who relies on the Lord? Then let the Lord save him. If the Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. Yet you brought me safely from my mother's womb and led me to trust you at my mother's breast. I was thrust into your arms at my birth. You have been my God from the moment I was born. Do not stay so far from me, for trouble is near and no one else can help me. My enemies surround me like a herd of bulls Fierce bulls of Bashan have hemmed me in. Like lions, they open their jaws against me, roaring and tearing into their prey. My life is poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, melting within me. My strength has dried up like sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust and left me for dead. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. My enemies stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. Oh Lord, do not stay far away. You are my strength. Come quickly to my aid. Save me from the sword. Spare my precious life from these dogs. Snatch me from the lion's jaws and from the horns of these wild oxen. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. Praise the Lord, all you who fear him. Honor him, all you descendants of Jacob. Show him reverence, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not ignored or belittled the suffering of the needy. He has not turned his back on them, but has listened to their cries for help. I will praise you in the great assembly. I will fulfill my vows in the presence of those who worship you. The poor will eat and be satisfied. All who seek the Lord will praise him. Their hearts will rejoice with everlasting joy. The whole earth will acknowledge the Lord and return to him. All the families of the nations will bow down before him. For royal power belongs to the Lord. He rules all the nations. Let the rich of the earth feast and worship. Bow before him, all who are mortal, all whose lives will end as dust. Our children will also serve him. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. They will hear about everything he has done. For those of you that might be interested, that's called Streetlights. And Streetlights, it's, you can get it on iTunes. 
And it is literally, they have every psalm in different ways, spoken word in different ways, all 150 of them. It's, it's pretty dope. It's dope to just drive around and just push play and just psalms, psalms. So this psalm of David, Psalm 22, and last week, if you were with us, we talked about Psalm 100, and that's the foundation that we start from, Psalm 100. It's, it's about thanksgiving. It's about praise. It's about coming to his courts with thanksgiving. Let's go. Let's give God praise. And I just kind of wanted to, in the first two weeks, I just kind of wanted to give us, I wanted to swing that pendulum all the way to the other side. And this, the genre of this psalm is a psalm of lament. This is a psalm of lament. So we got thanksgiving, praise, lament, kingship and covenant, trust psalm, wisdom song. This psalm is a psalm of lament. And if you take notes, write this down. Lament is a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. A passionate expression of grief or sorrow. And I will be honest with y'all because you seem like an honest group of people. Trustworthy even. I struggle with lament. Oh, I struggle with lament. I struggle with it because for me, it's like I don't have time to be sad. Mm -mm, I don't have time for deep expressions of sorrow. If I stopped and was sorrowful all day, every day, I would never want to get out of bed. Ha, ha, ha. And that's just not healthy. <laughs> that's just not healthy. And I've had to have a therapist tell me, like, that's not healthy. I'm like, mm-hmm, whatever. Laugh with me now. <laughs> like, like, because I just, I, I, don't, I, I don't camp out in hard places really easily. And what I found is when I don't camp out in hard places and I don't allow myself to surrender to God in a hard place, I found out that I miss out on an aspect of God that he so desperately wants to show me. Oh, because when it's hard, when I'm in a season of lamenting, when I'm in a season of questioning things, a season of doubting things, a season of hard, I, I, I just want the answer so I can get out of it as quickly as possible. And I just want to give somebody freedom to come before the Lord and just sit and give him your hard place tonight. Every single person that's in here right now, you are in here on purpose for purpose. What does that mean when we say that? It speaks to how intentional our God is. You may have not acknowledged Jesus as Lord just yet, but you are in this room right now on purpose because there is a work that God wants to do inside of you. There's an aspect of the Savior that you know you need, he knows you need, and he wants to reveal himself to you. So you are here on purpose, for a purpose. Some of you, you just need a word of encouragement in this season. Some of you, you just, need to, you just need to hear, you are okay. You're okay. You don't feel okay. Situations and circumstances don't look okay. But I want to encourage you, and maybe I'm just encouraging myself in the Lord tonight. You are okay. Okay. And it's not about being fake. It's not about faking it till you make it. It's about being real until you are in a place to surrender the outcome of your situation to a God who knows what's best for you. Lamentations. It's okay to come to God with all of your emotions. Most of the book of Psalms is about lament lamenting. Most of it are these deep expressions of grief, these deep expressions of sorrow, these deep expressions of fear, these deep expressions of I'm surrounded by the enemy and I don't know how I'm going to get out of here and I feel abandoned by everybody, God included. Lamenting is important because faith cries out for reality. Faith cries out for reality. 
I grew up in a time where you just kind of put on your best faith smile and, you know, hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm good, brother. Good in the Lord. Amen. Hey, God is still good, ain't he? Yes, he is. He's on the throne. Let's go. And it feels like it looks like you're not going through anything. But deep down, it's like I'm broken. I'm hurting. And then you think that is what Christianity looks like. That's all that Christianity looks like. And oh my goodness, that is an aspect of it because there is a joy of the Lord that is our strength. What does that mean? That means that the other things in life that we think will bring us joy are not meant to be our strength. Jesus's joy is our strength, enjoying him. And that's what we learned last night. Did anybody take the homework assignment and start enjoying God last week? Anybody do that? Let a few of us. Okay, I got one murmur. I got one murmur and a belly growl over here. Hallelujah. Somebody's hungry. So, like, 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 like last week, that was the thing is enjoy God again. Enjoy God again because the joy of the Lord is our strength. And here's what's awesome. When you can know and begin to learn that the joy of the Lord is your strength, you begin to trust that God with the hard things in your life. Faith cries out for reality and lament functions as an expression of authenticity. As we look at this psalm, the Holy Spirit has drawn to life all grief, sorrow, fears, doubt, hopes, and perplexities. Now, as we look at Psalm 22, verse 1, does anybody recognize these words? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? Anybody remember who said that? Who said that? Okay, 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 Bible thumpers. Turn to Matthew chapter 27. Let's check it out. Turn to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. I brought my real, my real Bible today. I'm ready, Jesus. I brought the one where you got to flip the pages and it takes you 20 more minutes to get there. Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Advent. No, I'm just joking. Okay, Matthew 27. All right, Matthew 27. Verse 46, and I have it in my iPad too, but I'm going to read it from the real stuff. I'm actually going to read verse 45. And the title there, I don't know if your Bible has a title or your Bible app has a title, but it says this, the death of Jesus, the death of Jesus. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. Verse 46, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli. Lema sebekthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So see, this is a psalm of David. This is a psalm of David. And David, like in context, before we get to the applications of, 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 of tying this to Jesus, who knew the Psalms, who would have had the Psalms, who, have, who would have studied the Psalms, um, we see David is crying out. And, and, and that, if you, if, you, if you take notes, write this down, cry out to the Lord. Cry out to the Lord. Jesus did it. Jesus cried out to the Lord on the cross. And here's, here's how cool the book of Psalms is. The book of Psalms is so fire. Jesus calls on the book of Psalms in one of his, in, if not the hardest moment of his ministry and his time on this side of eternity. He quotes this psalm. He calls on this psalm, and he says what the psalmist says. He says what David says. David felt forsaken. David felt alone. In this cry, we hear a sense of hopelessness. In this cry, we hear a sense of abandonment. And Jesus on the cross, we hear a sense of hopelessness. On the cross, we hear a sense of abandonment. And I know we, sometimes we just sit back and we say, well, where's Jesus? Jesus is Jesus. Jesus knew what was going to happen. Jesus knew what. But if he knew 100% how it was going to play out, he would not have prayed, Father, take this away from me. 
I don't want to die on the cross. If there's another way for a room full of people in the Jordan to have a relationship, to receive salvation, if there is another way, will you make it happen, but not my will, your will be done. That's Jesus quoting, praying this psalm of abandonment, a psalm of hopelessness. And I love this because it it reveals to us this thing about Jesus. Jesus the Messiah has so entered the human condition that he suffered in his humanity being rejected by God and people. See, the psalms open our eyes to a Jesus that is with us. The Psalms open our eyes to a Jesus that is so with us that he entered into our humanity and experienced the rejection, experienced the rejection from man, not only man, experienced the rejection from the Father because sin was placed on him. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. And if you take notes, write this down. In the midst of unanswered prayer, has anybody, pause on the writing, raise your hand if you have prayed a prayer that has gone unanswered. Be brave. Raise it high. Raise it high. Okay, now take a second with the hands raised. Look around. Look around at all these hands raised. They didn't have enough faith. No, I'm just joking. I'm just, look, I tried, tricked you, tricked you. No! Look! This is what we have in common. We run to a God and we pray to him. And when we pray to him so often, we have our idea of what it looks like for it to be fulfilled, right? But here's the thing. You and I, we don't know better than God. I know some of you have a master's in whatever you mastered. I know you do. You mastered it. You have the paper to prove it. But my goodness, Jesus is the master. <laughs> I had to skip on it a little bit. He's the master. Like, like, he, like this, is, this side of eternity is about us getting to know him more so that we can make him more known. It's about us getting to know him more so we can make him more known in the earth. Because family, people don't need raises. Pe- okay, some of us need raises. So I'm, not, I'm not saying that, but, I'm not, but, but I'm, what I'm saying is... The hope that we need that will never disappoint is in Christ Jesus. It's in Christ Jesus. That's the hope that the world needs. That's the hope that people need because it's a hope that does not disappoint. It's, a, it's the only hope that comes with a promise that says, I'll be there. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So this is a God that we can trust in our seasons of deep grief, in our seasons of deep sorrow, in our seasons of deep misunderstanding or lack of understanding. I just want to give somebody permission to come before God and say, God, I don't get it. God, I don't don't understand it because this is what King David does. And Jesus experienced it to the degree that he quoted the king, King David. He quoted him asking that same question, my God, my God, where are you? My God, my God, why you leave me hanging? My God, my God, I came to church and I have been serving you. Why do I feel like I'm at this wall right now? Why, 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 why? Here's what I wanted you to write down. In the midst of unanswered prayer, rehearse and remember. Rehearse and remember. Rehearse and remember. Look at somebody around you. Say, rehearse. Real quick, say it one more time. Say, rehearse. They didn't hear you. And say, remember. Rehearse and remember. Rehearse and remember. Rehearse and remember. And here's what we see in, 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 in Psalm 22, 2 through 5. What we see is we see the psalmist, he rehearses and he remembers. He rehearses and he remembers. He remembers the previous generation. He remembers what the previous generation experienced, what they went through. What does he remember? The first thing he remembers is their life. 
and he looks at their life and he sees that they trust it. So I, I love this because when we are in a position to rehearse and remember, it's acknowledging that I, maybe you're in a season where you don't have enough faith or you just feel like I don't have enough. First, let me just tell you that God just simply says, the Bible says, all you need is a mustard seed and it can move mountains. So some of, some of y'all, y'all mustard seed was taking steps in here today. Amen. So I just want to give you give you some love for the mustard seed of you showing up tonight, for the mustard seed of you inviting a friend tonight, because that's faith right there. But when you are down and out and in, your, in, and in a season of lamenting, rehearse and remember the life of those before you, the life of, their, of people's faith before you. They trusted God. They trusted God. That's what King David said. He sees and he starts to replay how they trusted, how my ancestors trusted you, how they, to you they cried out and were saved, verse 5. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. Sometimes you have to just remember somebody else's faith because you don't have none of your own. And that's okay. Oh, that's okay. It's okay to be real and come before God. Have you ever wondered why we be trying to hide stuff from God when he already knows it all? Have you ever wondered that? You be faking the funk, trying to make it, feel, make it seem like you really want to be praying when you know you really don't. And you come in like, Lord, I'm, just, I'm so happy to be here, God, in your presence. Mm. I've been looking forward to this time for like all day. And the Lord's like, mm, you fronting, but you're faithful. You're fronting, but you're faithful. Can I encourage somebody in their fronting faithfulness? Like, you front, but you're faithful. You show up, and God meets you in that place. He knows it all, so why try to hide it from him? He already knows what's going on and what you're experiencing. There's so much freedom in, there's so much freedom in confessing the things that you're going through to God. And let me make that super practical. Sitting in your car and just saying, Lord, life is hard. This sucks. And then praying, what if you prayed this prayer too? Because in the book of Psalms, we see that God looks at the individual and he also looks at the community. He looks at the individual and he also looks at the community. Maybe praying this, God, will you show me somebody that I can trust, that I can talk to about the things that I'm going through? God, will you, will, you, will you place somebody in my life that I can talk to about this season of lamenting and lamentations, uh, um, rehearse and remember? So you see, he rehearses and he remembers that they trusted. So because of their trust, maybe I can find a place to trust. He remembered their practice, their practice. He said, they cried out to you. They cried out to you. They cried out to you. He remembered that the people cried out. When it got hard, they cried out. When they were in sin, eventually they cried out. When it didn't seem like they would be able to make it, they cried out. So the practice, if I'm honest, some of my practice is I don't cry out to the Lord. I cry out to Instagram. I know y'all laughing at me, but I got, I got issues and I need Jesus. I do. I cry out to Instagram, and I'm like, Instagram, give me 25,000 reels that will make me happy. I don't care what they look, just give me, give me, give me, okay, give me 15. I need 15 reels, and then I need somebody to like the story that I just posted, and then I need somebody to repost the little picture of myself that I posted because I thought it was nice, and it would be very nice if they reposted it and tagged me and said, ooh, ooh, or so, right? <laughs> Oh, in your season of lamentation, in your season of deep grief and deep sorrow, who do you practice crying out to? Who do you practice crying out to? I have had to develop the muscle of crying out to my therapist. I've had to develop that muscle. Because growing up as a man, you stuff those feelings down. Get it together. You a man. You, ain't got, you don't feel nothing. Why am I feeling these things then? I don't know. You don't feel nothing. But I'm sad. So shut up. I don't want to. I want to cry. Don't you do it. What? 
Like, this is how we grow up. This is what, like, goodness gracious. And we, and, and we take those things and we place that on our God who says, come to me just as you are and watch how I show up just as I am. That's our God. And this side of eternity is about you and I growing to trust him more. To trust him more. So what's your practice? What do you remember? Because we see David, he remembers the faith of those that came before him. Oh, I, I, I believe God is maybe bringing to memory someone in your life that has great faith or they look like they have great faith. Maybe text them. Maybe call them. Maybe set up a time to talk to them. I want to encourage you, family, like, like we, we, we have a bunch of awesome little things that we're doing throughout this summer so that we can all stay connected. Summer sessions is one of those things. If you have a Sunday night free, please come. Because this is how we, this is how we practice. This is how we practice coming to Jesus. This is how we practice crying out to the Lord. And some of you just need a safe space. To bring all that you are. Because there's a version of yourself that you present to people. And that's a true part of you. But it's not all of you. And this other part that maybe you're ashamed of. This other part that, can, can, I, can I, like, the Lord wants that too. Oh, maybe somebody just needs permission to cry out to the Lord using real tears. It's okay. You're okay. And then he, he remembered their experience. Their experience. Their experience. And, and we can look back at the Old Testament and we can look back at the experience of God's people, the experience of the Israelites. And if we're honest, sometimes we read some of those stories, like when Moses goes up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments from God, and then he comes down, back down, and what are they doing? They've made a golden calf and they're worshiping the golden calf. I don't know if that's how they did it, but in my mind, the Bible should come to life to you like that. This is how they did it. When you read Moses, that's how they're worshiping. Like, like, we look at that and we're like, how could they, stupids? They're so dumb. Moses is just up the mountain getting the Ten Commandments. Why can't they just wait for him to get back? I take that question, I reverse it, and I put it on you. It's hard to wait on the Lord. Oh, it's hard to read on the Lord, especially when you live in a world where you can look at someone else's life and it looks like their life is moving at the speed of light in the direction they want it to move and yours is not. It's easy to do. It's easy to look at somebody else's life and say, I want that, I need that, this, this, this. Oh, but, but, but we serve a God who says, when you wait on me, that's where your strength is renewed. When you wait on me, that's where you get strength that isn't easily zapped away when things get scary and hard and you realize that you're actually not equipped to hold all the things that you're holding. But you and I are called to bring them to a God who says, bring me your deeply sorrowful season. And let me do in you and through you what you really desire and need. I'll read this scripture, Romans 8. It says, therefore there is no, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Take notes, write this down. In Jesus, sorrow and anguish will give way to joy and worship. Sorrow and anguish has the potential to give way to joy and anguish. And can I tell you, it doesn't mean, it does not mean that all of a sudden things are going to get better. 
and my feelings are just going to get in line. What it does mean is that when one of the scariest things for us to feel family is alone. I don't want to be alone. I don't want to feel alone. That's why we try to do what we do in, in this space and our team leads who are great at trying to say hi to as many people as we can because there's stories of walking into this room and it's so big. Where do I fit in? I don't have, a, there's no place for me. I feel alone. And because you feel alone, you walk out and you don't come back. We don't like feeling alone. And so often when we are a se in a season of deep sorrow and grief, we isolate and we feel alone. And I just want to encourage somebody tonight in bringing everything to Jesus. And if you can't get to Jesus, get to somebody who looks like they're already there and let them get you there. Oh, that's the beauty of community. That's the beauty of the fact that King David can go through what he went through and we can look at his psalm and be encouraged in the up and down of his emotions, but he consistently brings it back to a God who is with him. Last thing, seasons of lament remind us of who we are while also reminding us of who God is. Seasons of deep sorrow reminds us of who we are. What does that mean? Family, we're finite beings. We don't have all the answers. There's things you're going to experience that will highlight your brokenness. But it's hard to have your, high, your brokenness highlighted in a world when just the put together pieces are highlighted. It's hard, I know. But oh, when we can, when we can be reminded that I am a broken person and I need Jesus, and we see how available our God is in these places of lament. Worship team, y'all come on up. I'll, I'll get up here, I'll get out of here as y'all come up on the stage and kick me off. As we see who we are, we get to see how much more we need Jesus. What if, what if the season of sorrow and grief that you're in right now? What if it's meant to help somebody else? And, and I, I, I just, I, I just, maybe this is a thing that's like, okay, maybe a few years from now, right now I just need help myself. I get it, I, I understand. But what if you as the Psalter writing the psalm, this season of the psalm in your life, and you write about the grief that you're enduring, you write about the hard that you are trying to so desperately escape, and then you write about the God who met you tonight, the God who so divinely orchestrated you sitting in this seat tonight and spoke through a weird brother like me so that you can simply see that you are seen by Jesus. That we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise because he's good and his goodness is not based on how I feel. So I, as I get going here, I just, just want to encourage you, family. Just as you are, come. Just as you are, come. Just as you are, worship. Just as you are, let God 
meet you right where you are and show you how faithful, how good, and how able he is to do what you cannot do. Amen. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you. Thank you for every person in this space right now. Thank you that in seasons of deep grief and sorrow, we can come to you. Not for a quick fix to get us happy, but for an enduring presence. <sighs> hey, I just received that. An enduring presence. An enduring presence that will never leave us nor forsake us. So God, as a family, we say thank you that you are here right now and that we can enter your gates with thanksgiving and songs of praise, even if it's a sacrifice of praise that says I'm not feeling it, but your word says you are good. So I'll at least say and come into agreement with that. We love you and we thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. I want to...